Hey everyone, this is These Are My Friends. This is a podcast where I talk to friends and family about the early musical experiences in their lives, individual albums, specific bands, what songs made them wake up and realize that they were a music fan and dedicated to the art for their for the rest of their life. And today we have a first of a two-parter with my friend Clay, who is the guy that got me into doing community radio in the first place. Uh, Clay and I have a pretty good meeting story that I might share at some point. And he's been uh, a really good friend to, to talk to about music culture, musical memories, music history, his specific experiences being in bands in the 80s and also coming up through probably the, the greatest... Um, probably the greatest time to be a kid coming into into uh, the musical world in America. Um, you know, he was able to come of age in the 60s and 70s when, when some of the greatest American music of all time was being released. So uh, this will be part one. Next week will be part two. And let's get into the conversation with Clay, and I hope you all enjoy the chat. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> Well, yeah, that's the thing. I mean, when I was listening uh, to pop music, Top 40 Radio in the 60s in St. Louis, and there were certain songs that really caught my ear, uh, one of which was The Birds, Mm -hmm. uh, Turn, 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 uh, because that was on the charts at the time, and this would have been in the mid to late 1965. And every time that song came on my transistor radio, I stopped what I was doing and I would just lay down on the carpet or the tile floor or wherever I was and just focus on that song for about the three minute duration of it and just tune everything else yeah. out because of that that um, Roger McQuinn's guitar, that, that yeah. 12 string yeah. just totally caught me. And it it was like a switch in my brain getting turned on. I go, you know, really like this sound. And that probably influenced me later on. Mm-hmm. Um, that guitar sound and that, that, that kind of style. That, that song, but even a year before that, there was another song um, by The Animals, uh-huh. House of the Rising Sun. Oh, yeah. And that... Um, uh, oh gosh, who was it? Alan Price was the organ, organ oh. keyboard oh, player yeah, in yeah. that, and his keyboards in that song, combined with Eric Burden's vocals, yeah, and and Valentine's guitar and and all of that, just it. That was another song that just like locked on to me. Uh, yeah, that I really focused on, and that influenced me. I'm sure later on because uh, there was <clears throat> excuse me there was like vestiges of a little bit of punk in that song before punk was you know even a even a, a label yeah uh, with house of the rising sun um, yeah so i get that uh yeah and those are two um that like 12 string sound in particular like i've i've come to really love the birds too and obviously like a lot of music for me is like working backwards. Like I still love finding new artists who are contemporary, but I think you and I have probably talked about before. Maybe I've like talked on my radio show about like, I'm always trying to figure out like the lineage of certain artists or, or types of sounds. And that I would love to, because I love that 12 string song, or that 12 string sound so much in most contexts because it like you can note you notice it's a guitar but it sounds like it like sort of sounds like a harp too or or like a yeah it 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 just seems to like stand out in a way that it seems like its own instrument i guess and i think that I think I heard that pretty early too and like and hearing 
because my dad played like classic rock radio in the car all the time and i think like hearing like a few early tom petty songs and like um yeah uh what's it mike um what's his guitar player's name oh and tom petty yeah that um uh, yeah mike something or other whatever whatever um but that has like a real that like jangliness of that sound seems to like stand in front of like whatever whoever their contemporaries are so like that's a reason why i think like tom petty like stands out or like the heart heartbreakers music stands out a little ahead of like who there who else was being played on the radio with them i think Mm -hmm. and and then you can like if you're a certain kind of music fan then you can understand like oh well the the heartbreakers like must have been inspired by the birds because then you learn about that and then it has this like larger musical connection yeah because of all that history that you start hearing in the in the sounds of it and then it's funny you mentioned the animals too because and the the keyboard work and the organ work because that was you probably have like a way better sense of this but like that kind of keyboard playing seem to be like the like defining sort of sound of that particular style of music then too yeah yeah like where the guitar became like the guitar became like the center of everything in like the 90s maybe like the keyboards was like the center of everything in like in the 60s like for a two-year period there was just yeah, it was like almost like a, a blueprint was, was printed out for bands. This you have your <laughs> guitar player, your bass player, yeah. and your uh, you know your Farfisa or whatever Vox or whatever uh, or the um, um, oh what's that one the B three the uh, oh Hammond, yeah, Hammond yeah. Yeah. yeah you would have that that would be like an intricate part of, <laughs> of any band at that time right uh, suppose you know not. It wasn't uh, true necessarily with every band, but uh, yeah, it seemed to be kind of a yeah a, a blueprint. Well, um, and then there's also like that. I mean, it's like iconic too, like the 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 Booker T and the MGs song, um, Green Onions, or the instrumental that's like s- yeah, Green Onions. Y- yeah, is that what it's called? Yeah. I don't. I don't think I ever knew the name of that song. Oh, yeah. I just I just like know it for the the organ. I don't know if you'd right. call it like an organ mm-hmm. riff, but like that main organ yeah. part. Yeah. Um, and then, so how, like how old are you when you're like laying on the floor, like tuning everything out and just listening to that? When that first happened, string? like with the, uh, well, like with the birds that I was nine years old. Um, yeah. Okay. And uh, the year before that, obviously eight with the animals. Right. The animals were the ones that really, I would say, invaded my soul. Hmm. You know, they've really, it's almost, I I wrote about that in my book, that um, it's like all of a sudden um, I grew up a lot with, with that with that song. Or I felt like I was, um, that there was something else going on that I had never experienced before. Um, like there was a, I don't know, I don't know what the word would be, but I, I, I won't say that I felt wiser <laughs> but, uh, at the age of eight, but there was definitely something going on there that I didn't really realize and I wasn't sure what it was, but it was that feeling. Uh, yeah. Uh, definitely a feeling inside, like there was some soul, soul going on. Um, do you think that's because of like the content of the lyricism of the song or that it just had it like a it just had a general I, I like soul like you were saying yeah i think it was it was a combination of of things you know um alan price's keyboards um burdens eric burdens 
singing, yeah. um, even um, um, Valentine's guitar work. There was just it was just a combination of things, and I think it it also that at that part of my life um, there was also that connection. I I also made a friend. I was in for the animal song. I would have been. Um, in second grade and okay. I had a uh, friend of mine that I just made that year and he was kind of a rough and tumble kid yeah um, and uh, <laughs> it was like how's the rising sun fit oh yeah purple. yeah and it was sure. a favorite song of his too yeah. we would both team up oh they're playing uh, you know they're playing house of the rising sun on KXOK okay <laughs> you know um, Dennis his name was Dennis Saul uh, S A A L, and um, he would do things on a dare. Like he would go into the store, into the Toby's Hamburgers place. They had a little plastic cup, March of Dimes donations, uh-huh. and he said, "I'm going to go in there and 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 take that, but I won't steal it. I'm going to bring it outside to the table we were sitting at, and I won't get caught." And I said, Dennis, don't do that. No, oh, no, don't do that. And he goes in and he does it. He picks it up. He goes, it's all right. I know these guys that work here. <laughs> and he did. He brought it back out there. And it's almost like House of the Rising Sun was playing in the background. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. like, you know, this bad boy yeah. kind of thing going on. And uh, But anyway. Well, so. that's kind of interesting to mention because do you think that that sort of like imagining the song playing as that's going on maybe was like an early like you starting to create like film in your head because you've made short films too yeah and you know i well, i would imagine you have like a a skill to visualize like all of that yeah, when Content. I well, when I look back on it, I do. At the time, you know, of course, it's just happening. Yeah, right. But, um, but yeah, through the years, as I look back on it, all of a sudden these elements start being put together. Yeah, uh, soundtrack. Uh, this, yeah, this certain scene happening, um, that kind of thing. I think music, when you first hear it too, ties in a lot uh, with what's going on in your life at the time. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I was, you know, in my own case, I was having kind of a tumultuous, up, you know, I had a kind of a dysfunctional uh, upbringing. Yeah. And so that was, that was coming into play with whatever I was hearing, you know. Yeah. Um, like I didn't like a lot of the, um, until years later, I, I started to appreciate it. But at that time, things like, you know, um, just really saccharine kind of yeah. music that was going on. Yeah. And, I, you know, I, I could already in, in myself or going, oh, this is so, this is so fake or, so, you know, yeah. something. Um, but, um, yeah, I think, I think a lot of times it, you embrace music not only just for the sounds and, and those tones and those things they're giving you, you know, release, but also with what's going on in your life and you can right. relate to it as such yeah um yeah i've always wondered if like because i'm i do not gravitate to lyrics quickly in a song like i'm usually i'm usually attracted to sound first and like i sort of say tongue-in-cheek sometimes that like a singer could basically sing gibberish and as long as like the melody is attractive enough to me, I won't really care. Yeah. And that's not like that's not like completely true, but but it's just to sort of explain that it's just not what. And and Aaron's like completely different. Like Aaron will hear lyrics immediately in like total mm. detail, and you know I think that's just like her that's just like how her brain sort of attaches to to music um and i've always wondered if like because i've i've sort of like lived through music that way too where certain songs will 
like uh, it'll like almost feel like they're like written for me or something because they seem like so relatable yeah but the like lyrical content may be like completely unrelatable I, i'm the, i'm the same way it's like it, it, first is the music that's what catches me yeah um and and then later on, uh, oh yeah, what is he? You know, what are they talking about? Yeah. You know, kind of thing. And then you, re- and sometimes, like you're saying, it's like, oh my gosh, is that what? You know, is yeah. that what this song's about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah and I've been like a little embarrassed when like people who have a better, um, have like a better understanding of lyricism will point something out like that to me, and I'll be like. Oh, like, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. and I, the, I didn't realize, like, I was maybe supposed to feel sad listening to this song, <laughs> but, but, but because of whatever, uh, whatever is going on musically, that just, like, that goes into my body as, like, something that's up, uplifting or something like that, when, like, the lyrical content may be, like, the most depressing yeah. subject matter. Or, or like the inverse, you know, like maybe it's like, yeah, I don't know. I've always been a little confused, like why that. And and I think too, because you're taking, you know, you're, you're probably the same way. You're taking so much music in, you're hearing, you know, yeah. you, you know, you just want as much as you can. Right. And, and sometimes this has been true with me. Years will go by before I, before I realize oh, what yeah. the lyrics are. Yeah. And I'm going, oh, so that's what they're saying. I yeah. always thought they were saying, you know, it's that old joke about um, uh, Jimi Hendrix. Um, Excuse me while I kiss the sky. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you yeah. Know, where, oh, the, the kiss the sky. Kiss where this people, guy. Yeah, yeah. Where they're, you know, where, yeah. where people are saying, <laughs> kiss, kiss this guy. Right. You know? It's right. like. Um, there was. Um, uh the the fine young cannibals song um is a song called she drives me crazy oh yeah what is that the name of i know the song. i don't don't know if that i can't remember if that's like the name of the song or what but the chorus is like she drives me crazy like no one else but my sister was convinced it was that long white hair i think and she was actually like pretty good at just like imagining just like creating her own lyrics that sort of like fit with the syllables okay but um and again you know i was like i was like a little kid and i'd be like i don't know what they're singing i don't care i just think like it sounds cool it it sounds beautiful yeah you know the the tones and yeah i'm exact i was i still am i mean exactly the same way where uh the music comes first and then i'll pick up on the lyrics unless it's something like really you know out there playing right. that you can hear right, right away right and that you right. know you can't you can't escape that but uh um yeah and there have been a few instances when learning about the lyrics later on have actually enhanced the song for me like quite yes. a bit like yeah. that was like the missing or nothing was missing but i just didn't know that it was like going to elevate the importance of that song to me even more yeah it just added this huge beautiful layer yeah. on top of of what was already you know right um yeah extra added just uh, yeah i've had i've certainly have had that too um yeah so then when you heard turn 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 for the and I'm, i was trying to remember when you mentioned that um in some class that I had, I don't know if it was like middle school or early in high school or something like that, but we, maybe it was like an American history class or something, and we used, because I think Turn, Turn, Turn is originally like a gospel song maybe, or... Well, it it was written by, originally by Pete Seeger. Oh, right. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's uh, as right. a folk song, but he took some of the lyrics from um it's it's a bible um the book of uh yeah it's a certain verse right yeah it's a certain verse yeah um to every season turn 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 right um 
Yeah, I can't uh, I can't remember the name of that. Um, but yeah, originally Pete Seeger's song. He adapted it, adopted it, did the song, and then of course you know, uh, ten years later, or let's see, he did that song. I want to say 1949. Um, I might be wrong, but um, and of course then you know the birds right. uh, did their version of it, and you know. I, I don't know if anyone's done it since, but how you know it's almost impossible. How could you improve upon what the birds yeah. did with that? Um, yeah, sure. I mean, you could make another cover of it or whatever, but yeah, yeah. but it, it's like strangely, I have like weird feelings about covers anyway. I don't like. I don't blanketly say, like, I don't like covers because there are some, I can't, I don't know of some off the top of my head, but there are some covers that I think, um, actually, speaking of Jimi Hendrix, I think the Jimi Hendrix cover of, well, actually, Jimi Hendrix did many covers that are, like, Jimi Hendrix's Bob Dylan covers, I think, may be better. All Along the Watchtower. Yeah, like, All Along the Watchtower, and then, um. Isn't Please Come Crawl Out Your Window a cover, too, maybe? I might have that wrong. Um, that I'm not sure of. But uh, but definitely, uh, yeah, all along it, the It's lifestyle. rare. You, yeah, I would say so, too, for myself, that if, if, if it's a cover, I mean, maybe like 90% of the time I prefer the original. Right. Um, sometimes there is a cover that's done that's as good. Um, or yeah. at least getting close to it, and in rare cases, sometimes even better than the original. Um, that's I, I can't think of a, an example off the top of my head, but but the the turn turn turn. Somebody could probably totally reject this point, but to like the perfection of it, so to speak it seems to like completely embody like the time period that it came out of in a way yeah. that other songs might not do. Yeah. The, the birds did a lot of Dylan covers right early on and their first hit was, um, Mr. Tambourine man. Right. Just a few months before, uh, turn, turn, turn came right. out. And I heard that song. It was on the radio, Mr. Tambourine Man by the Birds. And it kind of caught my ear, but not near as mm. much as Turn, Turn, Turn did, at least for me personally. Um, hmm. Although I guess in relation to, to uh, you know, being on the charts as that was too, um, you know, there were as many people that liked, you know, Mr. Tambourine Man as, as they did you know anything that the the birds would come out with that for that for that uh two or three year period they could yeah. do no wrong it, it yeah. seemed like yeah right until that original you know lineup started breaking up or or breaking uh, falling out members members leaving um i was trying to think who was the first one to leave um it wasn't crosby well, it might have been David Crosby. Who, oh, I totally forgot he was in. Yeah, in the Birds. Yeah, and then there was also um, Gene Clark, um, the original member, and he left either right before Crosby did or right after. I can't remember, but um, and then the whole dynamic of the band sh- started shifting. Yeah, uh, but yeah. not in a bad way. They they made an incredible country album, you know, Sweetheart yeah. of the Rodeo. Mm. In '68, but uh, with Graham Parsons when he joined. Oh, and uh, oh yeah, I think I knew he. Was and then there. you had Clarence White come on board with them, the guitarist, and just you know their whole their thing changed. But but again, they were making great music still. Yeah, it was just different. Were they ever considered like a like a super group kind of thing. I don't even know if that was like a term. You know, then. I don't think so. I I don't think it was real. You know, the first time I heard that term super group was when Blind Faith uh, started up. You know, Eric Eric Clapton and oh. uh, Stevie Winwood. Oh. And that was the first time I remember hearing. I don't know if I even know that. Project. Super, super group uh, come out. They only did. 
uh, one album. Uh, okay. Kind of a classic, though, but... Uh, this is, like, pre-traffic Steve Winwood, or...? This would have been um, after, okay. shortly thereafter. I want to say either 1969 or 70, somewhere around there, okay. for Blind Faith. Um, but, yeah. Uh, that was the first time, though, I ever heard super group yeah yeah you know Crosby yeah. Stills and Nash were another one yeah. right around that yeah. same time they were considered yeah. that as well you know you had members of the birds and um and Buffalo Springfield right and, yeah and the Hollies it was, uh, oh. with oh with uh Graham Nash yeah um I didn't know that he came out of the Hollies yeah he was a, he was an early member of the Hollies up until I want to say 67 or 68 yeah that's that's one thing that I've always been really curious about um, the I guess it'd be like the early seventies or like mid seventies period of songwriting and musicians in Los Angeles that was like anchored around the like the like Sound City group of people i guess you would call it like um uh i guess like warren zevon might be in that like jackson brown yeah like early eagles or even like late eagles maybe but then like fleetwood mac yeah um i don't even know if it's like just los angeles either but it but it seemed to have a similar thing where there were all these like very talented people and they all just started like interchanging. Yeah. They all just started like writing songs for each other or like playing session spots on their albums or, yeah. um, you, you know, like, like the Eagle starting as Linda Rodstad's back in band or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Or coming from, um, like, uh, uh, Bernie, Bernie Ledden, yeah, uh, coming from the Dillards, and uh, you know, which was kind of a folk, traditional kind of uh, of thing, and and then, like you said, they started having you know playing on each other's sessions. Yeah. I'm, I was trying to think of the name of the uh, the uh, club in Los Angeles. Ah, that I can't think of it. It was, it's not the Palomino. Um, a lot of live recordings were done there, but it's where that certain those singer songwriters were coming together and the session players and um, I don't think you know some of them were based out of Laurel Canyon right. and coming out of that, right. but um, but this went even beyond um, is you know a little bit later too, with like you were saying Warren Zevon and Jackson Brown, uh, Linda Ronstadt. Uh, and the Eagles starting up, and then you had uh, Poco with yeah, um, right. from um, R- Richie Furre from um, Buffalo Springfield with Poco, uh, Chris and Hillman then, from the Birds uh, getting involved. He was in uh, he was playing with J D Souther and oh. uh, and Furre. Richie, um, yeah, th- there was a lot of that early '70s Los Angeles uh, music scene going yeah. on. That just it, w- it was huge. It, yeah. it was even beyond. You know, it started off as you know Sunset Boulevard, Hollywood, The Birds, Cicero's, um, in the in the mid '60s, in Buffalo Springfield, and those bands, it, then it just started like mushrooming. Yeah, um, just amazing amount of of music that was going on in Los Angeles, and that's just Los Angeles. I mean, you know, north up in San Francisco, yeah, there right. was a whole other thing that was right. was starting to uh, that was already starting to formulate and ferment. Well, I'm kind of curious about that too, because the, the other day. I think I texted you. We were listening to the Lifers album, and oh. Aaron had like come down and she was. I don't think I told her what it was, but she said 
she said you you had this familiar sound to Jim Morrison, and then like you had explained how important the Doors were yeah. to. Yeah, I don't know. That, that would be like a little bit later in your like musical sort of growth. Probably. Yeah, with the Doors, uh, you know, I heard them the first time. Uh, I always equate this not so much with years, but what grade I was in. Um, but that was the beginning of summer of 67 um, was Light My Fire uh-huh. when that broke on the radio from their first album. I think Break On Through was the first song that they tried to make a single from that album. Mm. And, you know, it did all right, but it didn't, as far as hmm. singles. I mean, the Doors weren't really a singles band to begin with, <laughs> yeah. you know. Um, you had to listen to that album. And I didn't hear that album in, until probably 1969 or 70. Um huh. But the singles I was hearing, yeah, "Light My Fire" was huge. That yeah. was a huge influence. And then there were other ones, um, um, "Hello, I Love You," uh, a lot of stuff from um, from um, "Soft Parade." There were several singles from that album. Um, but yeah, the Doors. So that's how I was first hearing the Doors. And then when I started getting into albums, yeah. 1970 I want to say or so it was like a treasure trove with the doors it was like oh, oh yeah. my gosh yeah but huh. I haven't yeah that was first time I was hearing a lot of that and I really connected with uh, with the doors um, yeah and there's even it's interesting you say though that they're like not a singles band because I mean they're what stand for their singles now have been like sort of played to death like on like classic rock radio or something like that and that's how I know them just because so it's wild for me to hear that a band like that who has so much just like cultural popularity just because of how often they're played maybe like when they were first when they first came out or when they were first releasing music that they didn't have that traction yet yeah that that or or that just like universal awareness of them yeah i think with the doors it was they were definitely an album band and then you know um they were kind of a an opposite of the summer of love Mm. ethos that was going on that year in 67 they were considered a dark right you know the opposite. Right. They they weren't sunshine, right? Flowers and everything. They were they were there was a darkness to them, and there's stories about them playing up in in uh, San Francisco at that time at the Matrix, um, which was Marty Ballin. Marty Ballin of the Jefferson Airplane was a co-owner oh. of that club, and um, there was like maybe twenty people in 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 the audience in the crowd of a it was a small club but i think it only held like maybe 150 people 200 but there weren't even it wasn't even packed for them and this was this was right after that first album got released i don't think um light my fire was on the radio yet it hadn't been released as a single but they were definitely known they were a major label uh band on electra records yeah but you know, for whatever reason, they just hadn't caught on yet. But huh. then when Light My Fire came out, I think is when people started going, oh, well, let's listen to the album. That was the other thing, too, about that song was Light My Fire is a seven to eight minute long song. That didn't fit huh. in with the um, with the AM, a, AM, AM Top frame, 40. Yeah. So they had yeah. to actually edit it down to a three huh. and a half minute song by taking out the middle instrument you know, instrumental yeah. part. Um, uh, so it's kind of like this really, when you hear it that way, it's like this really quick song. Like, wow. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> that was quick. Man, I don't even, I don't know if I've ever heard the... I've got a 45 of, of that song and it's kind of funny to listen to and you're going, oh yeah, where's all the... Uh, what happened to Manzarek's keyboards? Yeah. <laughs> huh. um, the, yeah, well that's... but. But then also th- with the Doors, they were when they were touring and their live shows were just something t- 
totally yeah. different that no one had ever seen before. Um, given uh, you know Morrison's uh, presence, right. so to speak. Right. So that was you an know, attraction uh, that's, too. Uh, um, you know, I don't know that. It, This is only like r- relatable as far as like stage presence goes, but I saw I went to a concert in Troy Monday night actually, like just two days ago. Oh, wow. um, it was this little venue, it was maybe like 150 people, maybe. Um, and there was this band, I was going to see this band, Drug Church, that I really, really like, and they're like a I don't know, like a sort of probably reliably play like three, 500 cap rooms, sort of like an alt rock band. Uh Um, But this, this band, this local band uh, prize opened up for them and they, I mean the, like the terms now for my generation are like, so it sounds so goofy from like people maybe from your generation where like you weren't concerned with like monthly listening numbers and stuff like that. But, but just for like comparison. So like the, so you saying like the doors had like 20 people at a show. So like prize has like only a couple hundred like monthly listeners on Spotify. So like, but like relative to like Spotify numbers, that's like, you know, they are a very small act, but Mm -hmm. very talented, musicians and the singer had this sort of general attitude where I came away from that being like these guys are either going to be like huge one day or I was very lucky to see a like unusually charismatic local Oh, band. Yeah, wow. Mm-hmm. And just on like the like the singer seemed like confident in a way that I have not seen like really small acts be super confident. And I know like stage presence wise, like I that was probably true of Jim Morrison too. Like he was a very like charismatic person. But maybe uh, like his stage presence always seemed like based more on like provocative behavior yeah he wasn't um from from all the interviews i've seen with him and books i've read um when he was sober Mm -hmm. he was a very quiet Mm -hmm. individual Mm -hmm. um when he drank he was the complete opposite they almost said, uh, th- I think Manzarek used to call him Jimbo when he was drunk. Like, he turned into this oh, character his Jimbo. Like and Mr. Hyde character came out yeah, or something yeah, like kind that. Of a, yeah, kind of a Jekyll and Hyde. Um, and I think that was true, too, when he was performing on stage. Um, you know, there's that old thing with the Oliver Stone film where there's a scene in the whiskey where he's got his back turned to the audience because he was too shy. Oh. to face the audience and that's actually true huh. um he would when they first were performing huh. he had his back turned to the audience and he was kind of hunkered down over into a corner <laughs> huh. and i i could definitely relate to that um from my own experience yeah in in singing um i was scared to death every time i went up on stage it yeah. took a lot to get me to, you know uh, well, once I started singing, then I was fine. I just had to get that first, yeah, wor- those first words out, and then I was okay. Huh. But uh, I remember one time we did a show early on, and we were opening for uh, the Jim Carroll band. Uh, Jim Carroll wrote the uh, Basketball Diaries. Oh, whoa! And had kind of a semi-hit back in in those days. They were based out of New York, and they were doing this show in San Francisco. And anyway, um, they were popular at that time. This would have been 1980. Um, And we got out, we came on stage, 
and the band told me that time, we're going to do this instrumental first, and then you come out for the second song. Well, it, they go out, do this instrumental, finish it, and they get booed. We're being booed. And I'm going, oh, man. You know, I was looking at the side door at the Mabuhe going, all right, do I hit the alleyway or do maybe I? Maybe they're I, just an instrumental band tonight. Yeah, maybe I'm they're <laughs> just an instrumental, an instrumental band. But I thought, ah, there's no way I could do that, of course. So I had to go out on stage. Yeah. And then we were fine. It was like, huh. you know, I think we even got an encore at the end. You oh, know, nice. it was like, and it wasn't because of me. It was just because, I don't know, people figured out, who are you guys? Uh, yeah. You know. Yeah. What's with this instrumental thing? Sound, you know, And it was actually one of Jeff Trott's compositions. But was that pretty unusual to do instrumentals at that time? If you were not, like, known to be... Mm. an instrumental band um maybe a little bit i don't think so much though i i I can't remember offhand if other bands you know in our in our sphere were were doing that as well but i think it was just something you know when i when i joined that band uh they already had that song and it was oh i think we even tried to do lyrics to it and it was just i go i don't think you can't do lyrics to this song Mm. it's just you know it's too too instrumental it's hmm. a, it's an instrumental so just leave it but uh, yeah um but yeah i you know i was influenced by the by the door by morrison the doors in my singing style it, my singing style kind of fit that groove anyway um yeah and then you know um oh ian um from uh, uh, Joy Division. Oh. Um, uh, Ian, goodness, uh, Kurt, Curtis. Yeah. Ian, yeah. Um, he had that same yeah, yeah. kind of deep vocal uh, styling, so to speak. Yeah, it's, it's kind of a wild singing style because it is it is musical, but maybe because it's at a much lower register it like almost tracks like spoken word in a way yeah um and and morrison would break out of that too and when he did like you know when yeah when he i don't know how you would describe that Um, well he would yeah so like in um like light like light my fire for example almost like a beautiful scream you know it's, right yeah yeah he would like really push at certain points and yeah his voice would break up quite a bit but it was not like a it was not like his voice was like failing kind of break up it no. was like it was like it almost it seemed to sound like larger than yeah it was like an additional you know range he could he could right. hit you know and it was just like i said it was beautiful it was just so natural and, right and uh yeah it, it, it's yeah i you know i'm i'm sure all right that's it for part one with my buddy clay like i said part two will be on next monday's pod um if you're interested in anything else i got going on you can tune in to here to listen which is the community radio show that i have on wvew and 107.7 fm in brattleboro vermont you can stream it online at wvew.org or listen live on 107.7 the show is every week at 12 p.m eastern and if you're curious for doing some reading you can uh read the here to listen newsletter, which is available at buttondown.email slash here to listen. All right. Catch you all next week. And thanks to Clay for being such a great chat.